Hello, my name is Isabel Wetzel. I'm Program Management Officer for Innovation and Technology at UN Habitat. And the topic of my lecture today is the rise of new and digital technologies, opportunities for African cities. So cities in Africa have doubled from 3,300 to 7,600 since the 1990s. They have added over 500 million people with 950 million inhabitants to be added until 2050. This growth occurs primarily in small and me medium-sized towns. This poses tremendous opportunities as well as challenges. New models of city, developments, uh, city development is needed. Increasing the use and application of innovative practices and technological solutions in city contexts is an effective means to reconsider the business as usual of cities and adopt more future-oriented, sustainable and transformative approaches. There has been a growing trend in recent years towards the adoption of digital strategies by African governments as they seek to improve service delivery, increase efficiency and promote citizen engagement. For instance, the Digital Transformation Strategy for Africa, which was developed by the African Union in 2019, promotes the adoption of digital technology and increases digital literacy across the continent. The strategy calls on African governments to develop digital policies and strategies that to support the growth of the digital e economy and promote social and economic development. However, there's not yet any definitive number of African local governments that have adopted digital strategies so far. What is clear is that technology plays a transformative role in shifting cities towards becoming more innovative as it puts people at the center. Many cities already utilize digital technologies to deliver services, manage urbanization processes, communicate with their residents, for example. Cities must embed these digital human rights uh, principles uh, in order to mitigate risks and ensure that access to data and services as well as people's rights are protected. One example of technology adoption and mobile penetration is that of Uganda. Uganda's technology and innovation sector is growing rapidly. So many public sector entities are uh, working together with innovators to scale and adopt new technological solutions that can address urban challenges. For digital ch uh, innovations, for example, there are a plethora of different support mechanisms. However, it is much smaller than for non-digital innovations. What is the issue behind that? It's often the lack of capital that is a major impediment. For some of the support mechanisms available, one of the issues is that it would need a proof of concept before any funding will be unlocked. In the absence of a strong venture capital scene, uh, startup or seed funding is difficult to acquire, which in turn creates a high risk profile for innovators. The mobile phone penetration is quite high in Uganda, with 46% of Ugandans or 19.8 million Ugandans using mobile internet. However, smartphone adoption is still low, with 16% of smartphone users in Uganda only, compared to the sub-Saharan African average of 30%. Many Ugandans uh, also rely on lower internet connectivity, that is 61% that are relying on 2G internet. So what we can see from this example is an expansion of availability and access to ICT infrastructure, However, cities and municipal governments still have to recognize how digital un innovations can unlock further opportunities also for their low-income residents and imp improve their livelihoods and access to services. The steady growth of mo mobile phone and smartphone connecti connectivity will evolve at a fast pace and public institutions at national and local levels will have to adjust towards increasing their innovation capacity to keep up with this rapid transformation. One other example of digital public platforms is that of the Gambia. The national government has presented a new roadmap on broad broadband strategic plan and an e-government strategic plan. However, an analysis uh, that, that was conducted by the African Development Bank has shown that what the government needs is an, a coordinated, holistic and ecosystem-based approach as each of the foundational pillars of a digital economy plays an important role in its own right but also depends on and reinforces others. So for example, if you don't have stable access to the internet 
And if you don't have a um, high level of digital literacy, which is also set up within a clear interoperability framework, that means among different departments, you cannot successfully set up digital systems, for instance, a payment platform that benefit all. Now, the recommendations to the Gambia in that same report have shown that the government has to improve efficiency and interoperability of these government operations, which also includes looking at how to facilitate strategic and coordinated leadership for these digital platforms. In the long run, the government also has to increase citizen and government interaction and civic participation to enhance transparency and accountability of these public services. Another long-term recommendation is the government of the Gambia has to strengthen the capacity of public institutions for evidence-based policy making, leveraging the use of big data. Now coming to the next topic of big data, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Big data solutions have the potential to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of African local governments, their service delivery, as well as promote transparency and citizen engagement. However, there are still some challenges to overcome, such as the limited access to digital infrastructure and the need for capacity building and training for government officials. There are a couple of cities that have already adopted big data approaches that I would like to highlight here. For instance, Cape Town. The city has implemented a data-driven approach to managing its water resources, which involves collecting data from various sources, such as weather stations, dams, and rainfall sensors. This data is used to inform decisions on water allocation, conservation, and infrastructure development. Nairobi has developed a platform called Nairobi Planning Data Portal that provides access to a wide range of data on issues such as land use, demographics, and infrastructure. The platform is designed to help urban planners, researchers, and policymakers make data-driven decisions. Kigali has implemented another data-driven approach to managing its waste collection services. The city uses GPS-enabled trucks to deliver, to collect data on the location and frequency of waste collection, which is analyzed to optimize collection routes and improve service delivery. Accra has implemented a GIS system that integrates data on issues such as land use, infrastructure, and population density. The GIS is used to inform decisions on urban planning, service delivery, and disaster response. Dar es Salaam has, for instance, implemented a data-driven approach to manage its public transport system, which involves collecting data on passenger volumes, travel patterns, and route efficiency. This data is used to optimize routes and schedules and improve service delivery. And lastly, but not least, uh, Chwani in South Africa has adopted a smart sustainable grid, which includes smart meters for citizens to monitor and manage energy use in real time, which also allows the city to monitor energy consumption and identify areas on, of inefficiency. Networks of physical objects of, or things that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies that enable them to collect and exchange data over the internet. What are the, what are the opportunities of the Internet of Things? For instance, uh, IoT can reduce waste and increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of urban services. So for instance, it can help to monitor in real time utilities such as water or electricity. It can also help to improve public safety and security. For instance, monitor crime hotspots or alert authorities on potential incidents. It can also monitor environmental conditions, for instance, air quality or alert authorities or citizens of potential health or environmental risks. And it could also promote citizen engagement and participation in urban governance. So, for instance, gather data on citizen preferences and needs and inform the design of urban policies and services or communicate between government and residents. What are some, some of the cons? So, IoT has still issues around data privacy and security that have to be addressed. And it is up to the governments or local governments to address that in their own digital human rights strategies.
For example, Nairobi in Kenya has been affected by high levels of pollution due to factors such as traffic congestion, industrial emissions and open burning of waste. So the city applied sensors on public transport to collect air pollution data. In 2019, a pilot project was launched to install these air quality sensors on public buses in the city. And that data was then transmitted in real time to a central database where it could be analyzed and used to inform decisions on air quality management. So that is an innovative approach to collecting data on air pollution levels in an African city and has the potential to inform evidence-based policy making and improve the health and well-being of citizens. Another example of the use of digital technologies in African cities is that of the human has aspects of this digital transformation. For instance, what cities have to have is that before they adopt digital solutions, they have to think beyond tech. So there are solutions such as human-centered design that can be explored before now you think about how to implement a digital solution. What is also key is that a good leadership is required for the adoption of digital tools. For instance, a mayor or an urban practitioner or a leader should be building capacity to measure and promote impact, should look out for new budgeting or partnership models, and also should nurture a workforce that is ready to implement digital solutions. This collaboration and participatory approaches are at the core of digital transformation for cities. It helps with information flows, learning and adapting to new processes. Without collaboration and participatory approaches, cities will run into the risk of designing wrong tools or wrong solutions that don't work for all. One of the key benefits to participatory approaches in a city is the integration with, for instance, munip municipal services, collaboration with businesses and startups, NGOs, residents, etc. One example of that is the city of Casablanca in Morocco. In 2015, the city launched the Smart City Casablanca initiative, which involved engaging with local stakeholders, such as citizens, civil society organizations and the private sector. The city held a series of public consultations and workshops to gather input and feedback on the design of the Smart City and to ensure that the initiative was aligned with the needs and aspirations of the city's residents. As a result, the initiative focuses on sustainable urban mobility, energy efficiency and citizen participation. For instance, through the design of a bike sharing scheme, smart traffic management systems and mobile apps that allow citizens to report issues and participate in decision making. Another uh, aspect of human participation in digital transformation is that nowadays uh, shifting collaborative approaches online can also help improve service delivery uh, within a city and the efficiency of that service delivery, especially in light of global uncertainties such as that of COVID-19. Uh, the example I want to give here is uh, four cities of the Aston network, which is Kumasi, Bamako, Nuakshot and Matola, that got together to enhance their existing systems with digital tools and tackled urban challenges based on their local priorities, but in collaboration with each other to explore how cities can also support each other in that journey. Now let me conclude with a couple of key messages. The expansion of ICT infrastructure and the national integration is high, making it a great enabling environment for innovation. However, one observation is that often it is larger cities with more capacity that adopt strategies and policies that support the use of new digital technologies. Smaller cities need more support in developing adequate frameworks for their digital transformation and building the right capacity to adopt new approaches. Pilot seed funding can cause a snowball effect of larger digital transformation processes. The private sector technical capacity is high and interest in multi-stakeholder partnerships is also very high. So we need innovators and we need innovative uh, financing mechanisms to explore seed funding that can now kickstart this effect of building new digital uh, transformation processes for cities. There's one challenge which is that blockades of implementation are not necessarily related to funding only but are sometimes political in nature and that has to be understood first. And lastly, while there are already many models of public and private sector partnerships to deliver digital innovations in local governments, there is a risk that profit-driven solutions may prevail over civic and sustainability solutions. So it is extremely important for African cities to adopt new solutions and approaches that are embedded in the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, ensuring that people 
and our planet come first. Thank you very much.